One of Charles Wesley's great hymns that unfortunately is not in our Trinity hymnal is called Weary of Wandering from My God. I love it because it expresses the heart of a Christian who's tired of their sinfulness and longs for holiness. Listen to its three short verses. Weary of wandering from my God and now made willing to return, I hear and bow me to the rod. For thee, not without hope, I mourn. I have an advocate above, a friend before the throne of love. O Jesus, full of truth and grace, more full of grace than I of sin, yet once again I seek thy face, open thine arms and take me in, and freely my backslidings heal and love the faithless sinner still. Thou knowest the way to bring me back, my fallen spirit to restore, O oh, for thy truth and mercy's sake, forgive and bid me sin no more. The ruins of my soul repair and make my heart a house of prayer. I'm not sure if that yet expresses the heart of Jonah, at least completely, though I'm not sure if it expresses my heart completely either. I do feel that way a lot, especially when I find myself repenting of the same sins again and again. I find myself often saying, Once again I seek thy face, love this faithless sinner still. And I think if we are charitable to Jonah, we should believe that this expresses the desire of his heart, at least in his good moments. He's not shown his best colors in the story so far. As you all know, he fled from God's call to preach to the Ninevites, probably for a combination of reasons in his heart, but mostly stemming from his suspicion that if he goes, they will repent and God will graciously forgive them. The Assyrians, Israel's greatest enemy and greatest threat to his nation's survival. But God won't let his servants reject his calls and will do whatever it takes to draw them back. God sent a storm after Jonah and Jonah was cast into the sea. As the waves came in over him and he began to drown, he thought his number was up, and he cried out to God in repentance. He knew God was disciplining him for his sin, and he cried out for mercy. God shows him mercy by sending the fish to save him. And inside the fish, Jonah is able to do some thinking. And the most important thing he learns is that salvation is of the Lord. It belongs to him, he is sovereign over it, and he gives it wherever he pleases. Then, once Jonah has learned what he needed to learn, God has the fish vomit Jonah onto land, probably right back where he started. Now, we asked the question last week that many ask of this story, is Jonah really repentant? Most of us know the whole story and know that his attitude is, uh, shall we say, not the best in chapter 4. But does that mean his repentance isn't genuine? I don't think so. I think it's unfair to expect that Jonah won't backslide, for we all know that we do. That's why I love Wesley's hymn and why he wrote in it, Once again I seek thy face. Love this faithless sinner still. Or to use the illustration from last week, Eustace, Jonah began to be a different prophet. He had relapses. There were still many days when he could be very tiresome. But most of those I shall not notice. The cure had begun. So, that's where we left the story. Let's continue it. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, Go to Nineveh, the great city, and called out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from the throne. 
removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes, and he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, that neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn away from his evil way, and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent, and turn from his fierce anger, so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that He had said He would do to them, and He did not do it. Weary of wandering from my God, and now made willing to return. The observant reader would notice that Jonah 1, 1 to 3, and 3, 1 to 3 are remarkably similar. The call is almost exactly the same, except that this time God explicitly promises to give Jonah the words he is to say. Though as a prophet, Jonah probably knew that was implied all along. That was the job of prophets, to tell the people the words God gives them. Yet the response is, of course, very different. Jonah has been made willing to return, and he makes the 600-mile journey to Nineveh. We don't get any information about the journey, but it would have taken Jonah more than two weeks, so he had plenty more time to think along the way. He also had plenty of time to lose his nerve and turn back if he didn't really want to bow before God's rod of discipline. I hear and bow me to the rod. For thee, not without hope, I mourn. Now, some have looked at Jonah's message and said that he's still only reluctantly obedient and giving the minimal possible effort. And at first glance, it might look that way, for the message is only five words in Hebrew, eight in English. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There are a couple of things, however, that should keep us from being too suspicious of Jonah. First, it may be that the message wasn't only this. This could be a summary of Jonah's message, and in his actual preaching throughout the city, he might have said more. Second, even if this really is how short his message was, God promised to give him the message to say, and the text does not indicate in any way that Jonah was unfaithful to that word from God. So, if we are going to assume something, we should assume that Jonah spoke the message God wanted the Ninevites to hear, even if it really was only these few words. We also need to think more deeply about the message. It actually says more than we might think it does at first glance. The Hebrew word for overthrown is really interesting and important to what the message is saying. It's the word hapak, and it does mean to destroy or overthrow, but can also mean to turn around or be changed, as in a change of heart. That's interesting, isn't it? The phrase could be taken to mean in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed, but it also could be in 40 days Nineveh will be changed or have a change of heart. Certainly the Ninevites saw it as a warning of judgment, but does that rule out the other possibility? Some have also criticized Jonah for not telling the Ninevites that they could repent in this message. But isn't that implied in the message? Why else would Jonah's God give them time to repent, 40 days, if the warning wasn't also a call for repentance? The Ninevites seem to think that it's there. In fact, in the Bible, divine announcements are sometimes given in this uncertain manner. When it comes to God's announcements by his prophets, sometimes, though not often, God's words are clearly decrees, and God specifically says that the judgment is coming no matter what. In these, he will forgive the repentant, but the punishment on the nation will still come. Most of the last part of the book of Jeremiah is made up of this type of decree. Sometimes God's words are warnings, and God specifically gives the option to repent and avoid the judgment. For example, earlier in Jeremiah chapter 18, God says through Jeremiah, If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil 
I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build up and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. Then sometimes God's announcements are like Jonah's and left open, or the possibility of relenting is only implied. Here that seems to be the case. For again, why else would God give them time? Thou knowest the way to bring me back, my fallen spirit to restore. O oh, for thy truth and mercy's sake, forgive and bid me sin no more. I think it's interesting that so often we get hung up on the miracle of the fish that we miss the most incredible miracle in this book, the turning of a whole city away from their sins and towards God. This really is the greatest miracle of this book, and when we think about it, the most unexpected. All the odds seem to be against Nineveh accepting the message and repenting of their sin. Jonah was a foreigner, coming at random, and proclaiming a short message of judgment against one of the most powerful cities in the world. At this time, they would have thought that their gods were more powerful than any other gods, which is why they were so successful. So why would they believe a random Hebrew prophet? Well, as this book has shown us so far, God is sovereign over sea and land and all of history. And a look at what can be known of Assyrian history at the time perhaps shows part of the reason. During the period Jonah would have ministered, about 793 to 753 BC, Assyria was experiencing a lot of turmoil. They may have been Israel's greatest enemy, but they weren't without their own problems. The Assyrian eponym chronicle shows that they were fighting to defend themselves from the Aramines and the Eurasians. They had had many years of famine, there were many internal revolts, and there was a full eclipse of the sun, which had been interpreted as a bad omen. If Jonah had come after some or most of these issues, they might well have been prepared by God to believe his judgment was really coming. God can and does use his providences to prepare people to believe his message. This is something that we need to remember when we pray for God's word to work. He doesn't just send us off with our Bibles and a command. He prepares the ground, so to speak, of the hearts of those who need to hear. Yet we also need to remember that God is sovereign over their hearts themselves. We don't have to change people's hearts. The Holy Spirit does that. We just speak the message of God's word as clearly as we can. As we learned from Colossians 4, 3, and 4 a couple of weeks ago, we pray that God would open the doors and that the message would be clear. He makes it effective on the hearts of the hearers. In Nineveh, God sovereignly moved to bring a massive revival to this dark city. And think about how we have seen God working so far in this story. The prophet tries to flee, but God won't allow that, so he sovereignly sends a storm and a fish. The prophet fleeing doesn't mess up God's plan, and in fact, God sovereignly uses it to convert a small group of sailors as well. Then the wayward prophet repents and gets back on track. Finally, a short message brings the most powerful city in the world to its knees. We might never have expected them to repent, though Jonah seems to have feared it. But God acted mightily, just as he has been all along in this story, and just like he has been in our own lives. With this surprise, we need to ask ourselves, do we think that about people in our lives who seem to be hostile to God? Do we doubt that God can really change their hearts? Well, he changed ours, yours, and mine. I'm not sure if we need any more evidence than that. But if we do, this story challenges us never to doubt, but to pray with hope. That person you think will never turn to Jesus is not any worse off than Nineveh was. God knows the way to bring them back. If he wants them to come, he will prepare the ground of their hearts. We just need to pray for open doors, that we won't duck when they come, and that we'll speak the truth clearly. I know a family who saw this recently with their grandfather, 
who became a Christian shortly before he died. We prayed for him for months, knowing he didn't have much time left and was very hostile. And God changed his heart just the week before he died. Let this story encourage you. God knows the way to bring them back. And any fallen spirit he can restore, as Wesley wrote in his hymn. Of course, we can look at this story and doubt the change, too. Did they really repent? Was it really genuine? Again, I think we shouldn't doubt it. First of all, Jesus said they repented. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Second, if all they did was put on sackcloth and fast, I might be more suspicious. But look at the king's final decree. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Do you remember what Jonah learned last week about repentance? Repentance is not just being sorry, but full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience, as the Westminster Shorter Catechism says. That's what the king sees that they need to do. And then in verse 10, what brings God to relent? It's not their fasting or sackcloth. That doesn't prove real repentance. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented. God saw their repentance was real, so he relented. It is true that it seems this change of Assyria did not last beyond this generation, for the next went back to their wicked ways and even destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. But that doesn't mean this generation didn't change. Just go read the book of Judges and you'll see that. God's discipline brings the people of Israel to repent. They don't pass it on to the next generation, so the cycle repeats. Why this change only lasted one generation may be as simple as that. The ruins of my soul repair and make my heart a house of prayer. There's one last thing we need to address in this chapter, and that is verse 10. A good Reformed Christian might be troubled by this verse because it makes it sound like God changed his mind. Was it God's plan to destroy them? And did he change his plan or his mind? In fact, if you read older versions like the King James Version, they say God repented of the evil he hath said he would do. Yet it also rubs most of us the wrong way to think that God would change his mind, much less repent of something. So what do we do with passages like this? Let me give you a few things to think about to help you with them. First, remember that the only language God has to use to communicate with us is language we can understand. Like a parent speaking to a small child, the infinite God has to speak in ways we finite humans can comprehend, which is why the Bible often uses analogies for God. We know God doesn't have real hands, but the Bible talks about them to help us understand what God is doing. We know God doesn't really have eyes to see, but the Bible uses that analogy to help us understand him and his work. We know God doesn't actually change his eternal plan, but the Bible uses that analogy to help us comprehend his working in space and time. Second, think about what we mean when we change our minds or repent. When we change our minds, we do that because we don't know the future and can easily come to new information that shows us that what we were doing was wrong, so we change. When we repent, we do that because we realize we were wrong and we need to change. God is omniscient, which means he knows all things, past, present, and future. Nothing takes him by surprise. There is no new information God could ever get. He knows it all. So nothing could make him need to change his plans. So when the Bible says God relented, it can't be because something new happened that he didn't expect, so he had to change. It is analogous language being used to help us understand what is going on as God works his eternal plan in history, in space and time. Third, we need to let explicit statements of Scripture qualify the unclear statements like this story. For example, in Malachi 3.6, God directly says, For I, the Lord, do not change. 
James tells us in James 1.17 that there is no variation or shadow due to change in God. And in Numbers 23.19, God says through Balaam, God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Those clear statements should make us see that whatever is going on here, God is not changing his mind or his plan. Finally, God does not change, but that does not mean that he is unchanging like a rock. He responds in space and time to the actions of men as our history plays itself out. That is not him changing, for whatever he does is part of his will that he works all things according to. But his relationship to us does change as we change with time. As we change and our relationship to him changes, his actions in history towards us change. So take this situation. Nineveh starts out unrepentant, and therefore they are under the wrath of God. Had they continued in their sin, then in space and time God would have judged them for their sins. For that is what a just and holy God does. That's why he was warning them with Jonah's announcement. By repenting, they've changed. So God's relationship to them has changed in time. So now he treats them the way he treats the repentant with mercy. In fact, that's what Jonah was worried about the whole time. He knows God is unchangingly merciful, as we'll see in chapter 4. But in all that, God doesn't change. He always punishes the wicked and has mercy on the repentant. While they were unrepentant, they were under his wrath. His plan was always that they would repent and be changed, but they needed a warning to know what he does to the unrepentant, which then drove them to repent. Then God, as Wesley wrote, opens his arms and takes them in, freely their backslidings heals, as he works out his eternal plan in history. So, Jonah's brief announcement was true. They would either be overthrown or changed. And the whole time, God was sovereignly working his plan like he was with the storm, the fish, and Jonah himself. O oh, Jesus, full of truth and grace, more full of grace than I of sin. Yet once again I seek thy face. Open thine arms and take me in. And freely my backslidings heal and love the faithless sinner still. You think about that. Amen.